Morning. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. What a wonderful start to the day here. Listening to Travis's mm. testimony. What a victory. I, uh, I've mentioned this before, and I'm going to mention it again. One of the first, I don't know if you'll mind, one of the first significant conversations I had with Travis was about a week, a week after he came up to the ranch. He, uh, I, I asked him to come on up into my office, and I hadn't really talked to him much until that point, and I just I let Travis know that um, I said to him, you know, Travis, it's just been such a pleasure having you here this, this week that you've been here. And he just kind of looked at me, and, and tears started running down his face. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, what did I say? And Travis said to me, he said, you don't know how long it's been since someone has said that to me. And, uh, we talk about victories here at Step 7. And uh, Travis, it is. It's just a pleasure to have you around here, buddy. Um, the Lord has done a mighty work. He's got a lot more to do. Yes. I want to start with a question today. Like we do a lot around here. And it's a, it's a biggie. The question is, What happens to us after we die? What does eternity hold for you? For the next few weeks, we're going we're gonna to look into this. We're going to dive into this. Do I, do I immediately go somewhere? Do I go to heaven? Do I go to hell? Do I stop by purgatory for a little cleansing on the way? <laughs> Do I simply rest in the grave until the Lord comes? Or maybe, maybe this is all there is. Maybe this is it. Let's all just eat, drink, and be merry. Mostly, I want to also look at the topic of hell. What's the, what's the straight scoop on hell? And you know what? I don't know. I haven't been there. I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know. And you know what else? You don't know. So, let's have lunch. How's that sound? <laughs> Actually, let's have another word. Yeah. <clears throat> Father God, we, we thank you. We thank you. We love you, Lord. I thank you for this time. I thank you for these friends. And Lord, right now, I just ask that you would speak through me. Help me to get out of the way. I just long to give you the glory here. Help me to do that. And just pray this, as always, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Tom, last week, preached on step six, which says we, we came to accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And the accompanying verse that goes along with it, which is John 8, 32, one of my favorites, we... We quoted a ton around here. Then you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I plan on pursuing for the rest of my life the truth as it is in Jesus Christ. But you know, there are just some things that we don't know. And we will never know. And we need to be careful and we need to be tolerant in this study. You don't need to go there. I'm going to do. You just don't need. Uh, let me read out of 1 John here. 
It says, as for you, the anointing you received from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it has taught you, remain in him. So we need to remain in Christ. And I ask that we all do that for these next few weeks. But I like what this says here. And years ago, this wasn't one of my favorite verses as a pastor. It starts off by saying, you do not need anyone to teach you. The older I get and the longer I've been a pastor, the more I appreciate this verse. You do not need anyone to teach you. I hope and pray that what happens in these next few weeks is we raise some curiosity. We start asking some questions. We drive you to the Word of God to research it on your own. I don't want to be one of those pastors, and I used to be one of those guys. I was a strictly by-the-book kind of pastor. If you had a question about something, I had an answer for you. And I could prove it to you with a text out of Scripture. Hopefully I've softened up a bit over the, over the years. Hopefully I've changed. I've, I've softened a bit. We have a, here in, in, in Parker, we have a group of pastors that gets together once a month. We meet over at the Egg and I for coffee. And there might be five of us sitting in there. There might be 15 of us sitting in there. And it's a very, it's a very interesting time. There'll be, there'll be a whole lot of denominations represented in the room. My background, as most of you know, is, is Adventist. Step seven is pretty much non-denominational in here. But the room will be filled with a bunch of pastors and I tell you what, you get a room full of pastors, and you've got a room full of opinions. Very strong opinions. And I love these guys, and I enjoy the time, but sometimes it can be a little frustrating for me. Because we all walk in there, and we're guarding our doctrine. It's a little tough to be real transparent in there, because everybody's guarding their doctrine, meaning simply teaching. Doctrine is just another word for the teaching that we have. We don't have a lot of doctrine here at Step 7. Our teaching is get into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Our mission is sharing Jesus with the addicted. I pray, you guys, that these next few weeks create some curiosity, create some questions. But I also pray that we keep a, a soft heart. Hebrews chapter 4 says the Word of God is living and active. It's living and active. And I've recognized that over the years. I spend a lot of time in my Bible. And I'll read something and I'll say, wow, where, where did that come from? I've read that verse who knows how many times, but it just jumped off the page at me today. The, the Word of God is living and active. Mm -hmm. This is the Amen. most incredible book there is. The book. The Bible. Biblia. You know what that word means? The word Biblia. Bible. You know what it means? The book. <laughs> this is the book, you guys. I, I pray that these next few weeks create some questions, create some discussion. And I also want to make sure that we get this right. None of this is salvific, meaning none of this has to do with salvation. So don't worry about it. What you think, what you believe, I hope it comes from your study of Scripture. But here at Step 7, our goal is to get you into a relationship with Christ. 
And that's what works best, is knowing that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I have one. His name is Jesus, and he saved me 2,000 years ago at the cross. That's what matters, my friends. Amen. The stuff that we're going to look at today is just periphery in the next few weeks. I, I find it sad when Christians separate, and we've done a marvelous job of that over the years. There are over 40,000 denominations within Christianity in, in America, and everybody is guarding their doctrine. And there are as many teachings as what we're going to be looking at today in these next few weeks as there are denominations. And that's okay, my friends. But it, it's kind of sad sometimes. You, you know, you got this church here, and they, they talk about the church across the street over there. And they say, you know, that's a wonderful church. They're all about their relationship with Jesus Christ. But you know what? They do baptism wrong. They do baptism wrong. They sprinkle. You're supposed to dip. <laughs> <laughs> or the other churches say, you know, that's a nice church over there. They, they point to Jesus. But they're thinking on the state of the dead. It's all wrong. They teach that you rest in the grave. We know you immediately go somewhere. You know what, folks? So what? I was saved by Jesus 2,000 years ago at his cross. And I'm thankful for that. Amen. And today, in these next few weeks, we need to be tolerant and loving in what we're going to be looking at here. Believe what you will. You won't hear many pastors say that. Believe what you will, but do it based upon your study of the Word and your relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. If you do that, you will be safe. Here's a, a good example. We, I just mentioned the state of the dead. What happens when we die, immediately when we die, before Jesus comes back? You know what? I don't know. <laughs> and neither do you. There's the teaching that, you know, we go somewhere, just like that. There's the teaching that we rest in the grave. There's the teaching that nothing happens. Personally, and I'd be happy to talk with you about this, and again, it doesn't matter. I see the preponderance of evidences here. I believe that we simply rest in the grave until the second coming of Jesus Christ. But again, it doesn't matter. It does not matter. I don't know, and neither do you. I, I want to have some fun with this. I want conversation to come about with this. But again, I want us to be tolerant, my friends. I want us to be loving and tolerant. John 8.32, Tom talked about it last week, says, Then you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And in my pursuit of John 8.32, I want to be loving, and I want to be tolerant, but I also want to be diligent. Believe as you will, but do it based upon your study of Scripture and your relationship with Jesus, and you'll be safe. Quickly, we, we mentioned the word hell. And in, in mainstream Christianity, we have some, some teachings out there. We have, we have eternal <laughs> damnation, eternal torment, eternal torture. That's one of them. It's been around for a long time. We have what's known as annihilation or annihilationism. 
And then we have this teaching called Universal Restoration. And I can stand up here today and I can make a case for all three of them and I can do it strongly using the Word of God with proof texts. I can proof text anything to you. Turn to Revelation chapter 20. We're just going to look real quickly here before we finish up at some text that have brought these concepts about. Revelation 20. Way to the back of the book. Revelation 20, I'm going to read verse 15. And it simply says, If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Yikes. Sounds like eternal damnation to me. Turn to your left. Turn to Matthew 25. This is one of the kind of the Hall of Fame verses on this topic. The last, the last verse in Matthew 25, verse 46. And it simply says, then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Sounds like eternal damnation. Turn to your left, to Ezekiel, pretty much in the middle of the book. Ezekiel 28. have a red pew Bible, maybe spit out a number on that one. Who's got a page number? 695. 695 in those pew Bibles. Ezekiel 28. And in the NIV, we have a title above verse 1 that says, A Prophecy Against the King of Tyre. But it kind of morphs over and we end up seeing it's, it's kind of speaking about Satan here, these verses that I'm going to read. This is speaking about and to Satan. Um, Ezekiel 28, let's read. Let's read 18 and 19. It says here, By your many sins and dishonest trade, you have desecrated your sanctuaries. So I made a fire come out of you, and it consumed you. And I reduced you to ashes on the ground in the sight of all who were watching. Verse 19. All the nations who knew you are appalled at you. And you have come to a horrible end and will be no more. Sounds to me like annihilation. He says, so I made a fire come out from you and it consumed you. The last part of that last verse I read says, You have come to a terrible end and will be no more. <laughs> Sounds like he goes away. It's destroyed. Annihilation. Turn to 1 John. Way towards the back. First John. Chapter 2, right before Revelation. If you get to Revelation, you've gone too far. 1 John chapter 2. I'm going to read the first two verses here.
1 John chapter 2, verse 1. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for our sins, but for the sins of some of the world. Yeah. <laughs> the whole world. Most of the world. Says the whole world. Says the whole world. It says that Jesus Christ is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, but not just ours. Everybody. Sounds to me like universal restoration. Turn to John chapter 12. Gospel of John. John chapter 12, verse 32. This is Jesus speaking about his crucifixion. John 12, 32. These are red letters. John 12, 32. Jesus says, but I... When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. But I, when I am lifted up, I will draw everybody to me. <coughs> and that word draw there, in the Greek, is the word helkio. And it literally means drag. So you could, re you could reword that verse. To say, but I, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will drag all men to me. Maybe some of them kicking and screaming. My friends, we, we have a lot of questions here this morning. And again, I don't know the answer. We're going to take a look in these next few weeks quite a bit more about what the Bible says about this topic. But again, today, I don't know, nor do you. And again, it doesn't matter. As long as we honestly search Scripture for truth, and we do it based upon prayer, study, and our relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what matters, my friends. That's what matters, our relationship with Jesus. Amen. Next week, we're going to look at the teaching on eternal hellfire. I hope you all come back. Bring someone with you. Let's pray. Father God, we... We thank you, Lord. We love you. We need you, Lord. I want to thank you for this wonderful day. I want to again lift up my buddy Travis. I want to also lift up Howard. I want to pray for everybody who has anything to do with Howard's care over there, the doctors, the nurses, anybody that has anything to do with his care. I just pray that you give them guidance and give them direction, Lord. Father, I, I just thank you for all that you do in, in all of our lives, for loving us as, as Travis quoted Luke 19, verse 10, that Jesus came to seek and to save that that was lost. And we thank you for that today. We love you and we pray this as always in Jesus' name.